Oh, don't make me watch this again. Don't make me watch this again. We're watching this again. Damn it. I'll get a new angle this time. So infuriating. And he's so smug about it. He also, your your best friend's dead, presumably. He's also ripped. Gotta give it to him. It's so heartbreaking and frustrating. One of the craziest things to me about this whole thing, this whole moment, is that this is Jujutsu Kaisen, this unbelievably imaginative world of these amazing curses. Turns out, I guess it's no surprise, the biggest cursed item in the game is a gun. Just a handgun. It's time for some revenge. I hope Ghetto just wipes the floor with him, but I feel like it's unlikely. He's still shooting. Those reflexes, though. Th that accuracy. Everything he does just looks so smug and cool. <laughs> oh, episode 28, Hidden Inventory 4. Hate this guy, but he's, he's pretty badass, gotta admit. Great villain for this arc. He reminds me of people that I run into. I don't know how to explain it. There's this terrible combination of people you meet. They're like the most infuriating for me. People who are rude and are terrible people, but also have a lot going for them, so you can't even like... You gotta find a way to mentally rectify that in your head. Like how can this person have all these great qualities, qualities that maybe are envious, yet have none of the, the good qualities you tell yourself are vital for being a good person and living a good life? Not to say his life is good, I'm sure his life is terrible. But just the way he comes across, like, super poised, witty, jacked, capable, fast, ladies man, you hate him. You hate him. Someone who's better than you in, you know, a certain way of scaling life and is condescending about it. <laughs> Not to mention intelligent. He had all figured out, didn't he? The gun is less terrifying. But Thanks for that. Uh -huh. Pretty great system. Speaking of great imaginative curse systems. Not to mention humble. He's just toying with him, just taunting him. This isn't even a, a like the usual thing in the show where they talk about their powers to make their powers stronger. He just is enjoying this. He just enjoys talking about how he defeated them with cunning and why everyone we love is now dead, presumably. I don't- that was my first thought, but I don't know. Does it? Okay. I think he would do it anyway. Huh. There's a very, like, real-life human physical theme to his whole character. He let him talk for a really long time. I'm surprised Gato's that calm. Maybe he believes on some level, like all of us, that Gojo can't really be dead. Nothing could kill Gojo, surely. He's immortal, invincible. No one that handsome can die. Uh, we've established this guy's accuracy with a handgun is inhuman. Did he choose a sword? This is already shaping him to be beautiful. The visual's already amazing. Why was that so painful? Hope it can be reborn. Damn, when someone calls your cursed dragon riffraff. No. <laughs> you just break the non-violence barrier? Oh! Whoa, that is so cool. I mean, we knew he could absorb spirits, but seeing it in action is amazing. It seems too good to be true. Yeah, there it is. Maybe his level's too high. What in the- what in the hell? Who is- who is gonna stop this guy? Maybe they just won't. Maybe it's just mission complete, and he leaves to go, go on to create more foster children. Even in the middle of fighting someone who's the most gifted person, he's still calm enough to think 8,000 steps ahead. This is a huge wake-up call. They won't.
He's alive. Even, even having seen season one, it's still a relief. I can't believe he just walked in there and won. Did he even break a sweat? That was such good setup, man. It's so great because he took down two people who have been established, well established as being untouchable. So to watch them get wiped out, and as the guy mentions by a non curse user, it's terrifying. And one reason I think they did it so well is that it didn't feel like it just happened for the plot. The guy actually legitimately seems like his edge is cunning and their weakness was complacency and I actually I think that is a potential pitfall of being at the top or being really high skilled who are you preparing for who are you competing against how do you chart a path to get better when you're already at your peak or at the peak of what's known people below you meanwhile know where they have to go know who you are better than you know who they are and are gunning for their spot and have maybe more hunger I think I've heard the tenet before that when you're at the top when you're at the best that's when you put your foot on people's necks the most you use the extra advantage you have to crush anyone coming for you because it will happen eventually it will happen I mean if you just enjoy enjoying where you are, enjoying the state you're at, not thinking about growing or innovating. In this kind of animal world of competition, brutality, someone will get you eventually. But man, there's a big reckoning coming, coming for these two. I don't think things will ever be the same again. How could they be? Yeah, just mission accomplished and leave. There was no stopping him. Oh. Wow. really interesting history. Backstory. I feel like there's so much more to that. There's so much more to that. Who really knows? I know I said this before, but I'm still suspecting some kind of Evangelion thing where protecting humanity is is a goal, but it's like protecting humanity long enough to do some other nefarious goal, something more more selfish. There's something just off about Tengen, that whole basement labyrinth. One thing I love about this scene is that even though it's not super explicit, I can kind of feel the difference in power and influence between these two groups. Like Megumi's dad and this guy are working for the Star Plasma group but just seems so far above them and you can kind of see that in their demeanors like this this guy just seems kind of weak and crazed he's just like a little gnat that is nipping at the Jujutsu society and he happened to get lucky with these guys who are actually super strong I also wonder what their ultimate objective is could it just be money and it's possible but it seems like they could do so much more I mean maybe it's money for something for some bigger plan <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He summed that up. This is a very weird comparison, but Megumi's father reminds me a little bit of Spike Spiegel, but like really corrupt Spike Spiegel. He's like the most capable person, but hides it with a guise of being kind of goofy or not all there or not focused when it's the opposite. It's just a mask or it's a separation for benefit of that power. Having a clear on off, being totally in the zone, going with the flow, not carrying unnecessary stress, having the confidence that what you need is there when you need it. I hate making that comparison about him because I hate him, but he's got that that same kind of swag. Both of them are pretty smart. We're really sticking with them too. Here we have the motivation. Fancy restaurants. Oh! Has he he healed up at all? <laughs> he just came back. Yo, what's up? That was some clutch timing, figuring that out. <laughs> he, he's one to talk. Oh, he, he... Who knows where he is where he is right now. He's elated, but this is... I mean, this seems like insanity. I mean, Gojo has a jump this time. No, no, I feel Gojo has this one. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him. He's just he's like an angel. Oh, right, yeah, he was struggling with that before. You got it. Something's off about Gojo for sure. Oh, he's ignoring. Speaking of pride getting you. 
He's ignoring his instincts. I mean, I could be wrong, but just my understanding, my limited understanding of Wiljo's powers, and given the way matter works, and how there's just so much empty space, at a certain point he wouldn't even have to dodge, right? He could just let things pass through him. Yeah, we're all sorry for Amanai. Oh, he's sorry because he doesn't feel anything. This is some bizarre enlightenment. We're like watching Gojo's enlightenment in real time. <laughs> Speaking of humility. Purple, yeah. Beautifully animated. No doubt. There you go, here's some of the darkness. Grudge. Yeah, he let go of his control. His best asset. Nope, it's not there. It's really gonna be flipping about it. <laughs> True to character. He had that moment internally. This turned out to be key. It's an interesting thing to say. Is that regret? How deep does the hole go? Damn. He's such a great villain. He was only around for a couple episodes, but man, did they do him some real great justice. Truly a, an enemy worthy of, of Gojo and great development in that sense. Great counterpoint to force that moment for Gojo. That true understanding of curse energy and the enlightenment it seems to have brought. Anyone else get a feeling of just extreme danger from Gojo? I mean, that's always been a part of his character, but it felt so poignant there where you're happy for him and you're like, wow, he, he's done it. He's reached the pinnacle. But you're like, God help us if this goes wrong. You know, if he's not a great guy and isn't centered. From here on out, whatever Gojo wants, Gojo does. And also, while it's really tough, the whole like not caring about Amanai dying and the enlightenment thing, I understand it on a conceptual level, but it still is scary. You can imagine if you had just perfect, beautiful understanding of the world and nature and all its workings and harmony and the total scope of, of life and existence and death and rebirth, would you mourn the, the deaths of individuals or would you rejoice just the fact that life happened and that these things happened and can still find beauty in the fact that you can still feel them and they still exist and people have legacy and there's this long unbroken line of existence of which all people are a part whether living or dead not that you couldn't also mourn right I, I mean i think you can be in both states simultaneously but then again there's something non-human about that or unnatural and again like i was saying before raises questions of what do you do with this newfound wisdom or or knowledge or enlightenment because there's false enlightenment for sure kojo has convinced himself of of something that is greater than humanity and greater than the bonds and the people he knew almost like it's a drug that's how it's being portrayed that raises some weird doors about what is okay you know what is acceptable in terms of what he does because if it doesn't matter if no person's life matters or if it matters outside of their individual lives and it's something not beautiful and and not divine or it does not include the beauty and divinity of humans that are alive and the things that exist and things that need to be preserved what's to stop him from going Going into that classic villain thing of like I'm I'm better than humanity or I will become a god and therefore losing the importance of those very things. Now I know Gojo having watched him for over a season, so that reassures me that it's not that or at least not yet. But it was so well done that scene, just all the conflicting emotions and the depths of the beauty and power and possibility and the one step over the line of being human to not be sad about Amanai at all is crazy. Although perhaps that was just a moment. Perhaps he has or will mourn her. I guess the overall question is what keeps Gojo's feet grounded to the floor and to other people? This is a random thought that I'm just going to throw out there. But you can even make a parallel between Gojo and what he just experienced and what Amanai was saying about joining with Tengen. You know, she was expecting to gain some kind of access to broader god powers. And it seems like Tengen was once a religious figure who put himself forward as a god. I suspect that Amanai was not going to get what she thought she was going to get. I keep going back to this, but there's something just instinctually dark to me about Tengen. This deity that sacrifices the lives of others. Is that not a parallel then between Tengen and Gojo? But Gojo's got there by himself and he seems to be for humanity, for humans. Whereas Tengen in name is for humans, but also is perfectly fine sacrificing vessels. And we also know that later in this very society, they're fine sacrificing one of their own in order to keep the peace or do what they think is best, which is a very ends justify the means type thinking. We also happen to know that Gojo is not the best friend of the society. He seems to be in it voluntarily for what it can do for him, or maybe because some of their stated means are aligned for now. This makes me wonder even more if there isn't some kind of faded matchup coming. 
an after credit scene. You all right, buddy? Oh, <laughs> no thanks. Oh, he can absorb it. He gets his powers. That actually could be huge. And everyone clapped at the end. Speaking of them being at odds, this has got to put some a bad taste in Gojo's mouth. This whole Amunai thing. Is it? He's, it is, but it, it he's not the same anymore. Maybe in a sense Gojo leaves Ghetto, if you know what I mean. Gojo's kind of gone. Can he be, have a friend? That's what I'm saying. This is exactly what I'm saying. Look at this contrasting. Who's the immoral one here? That was a very different conversation than the one they had in the basketball court. Ooh, there's just so much that I can feel, but I'm not quite sure yet. I can't quite articulate. Everything has just changed. Their relationship has changed. It feels like Ghetto is the one holding holding things together, which is really interesting given where they go. That was what I was worried about for Gojo off the bat. Like, wh what does it matter anyway if you're in touch with the infinite? Also, this is not out of nowhere. It's not a surprise. We've seen Gojo. He keeps it together well in the present, but he also seems to have a little bit of bloodlust. Like, he relishes any opportunity to use his powers. Though, at least, there's some constraints on it. It could go so much worse. It could go so horribly wrong if Gojo just unleashed, doesn't give a crap, just becomes a god monster. Ghetto and Gojo end this section in very, very interesting places, but I think one thing has become clear, and that's both of them have experienced some kind of disillusionment. When we started this arc, they were kind of happy-go-lucky. Oh yeah, we're Jujutsu sorcerers, and our job is to protect people, especially Ghetto. Now that it's ending, looks like they're fighting to find some kind of meeting. Ghetto almost trying to reassure himself that there need to be lines. I think I said in episode one of this season that sometimes people's stances, their virtuous stances, actually can reveal some of their, their dangers or their evil. And vice versa. For Ghetto, in that basketball scene, he was talking about, you know, the weak and the strong, and that represents a risk. What does that kind of disillusionment look like for Ghetto, who has established, like, this, these classes where the Jujutsu Sorcerers protecting the weak? Well, you get disgusted with the weak, especially because it's such a thankless job. I mean, look what they're going through. And for what? They weren't even successful in this mission. And uh, it just feels like there's a rift now, and he's going to lose his friend. I, that might have been one of the, ma the main stabilizing forces keeping him on a, a good track, a positive track. For Gojo, I'd say he's more of a, a risk as it's being depicted right now or from the start, as, you know, who cares? Things don't really matter. It's just me living my life. Well, what's the opposite of that? Finding meaning ground up for yourself in a way that's not just swallowing what other people are giving you. And being extra resolute in that. And with Gojo's strength to back that up, if he manages to find that, he ends up being great. There's this light side, dark side element to both of their characters, and we know how they ultimately end up. Although Gojo is still a little bit of a question mark in the grand scheme of things. This is a horrifically sad sequence of events, not just because of Amonai's death, but because of what seems to be a loss of friendship. This is the end of the era that they know. That beach episode in Okinawa was sort of the last ray of sunshine in their lives together.